Neil Marshall. Thank you, Sam. Hi, everyone. Um, that seems to be working, which is very good news. What an absolute privilege to be introducing Neil Marshall, director of one of my favorite films of all time, The Descent. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. It's hard to believe that this film was released almost 20 years ago, um, but I was so young when I first watched it, oh, I, don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually remember a world without it. It's been nothing and then The Descent for my whole life. Uh, um, I kind of don't either. <laughs> um, I'm sure that everyone who's attended the screening has remembered what a phenomenal film it is and also what a joy. Um, so thank you again for joining us, Neil. No, thanks. I was going to say, I know there's at least one person in the audience who hadn't seen it before. Oh, yeah, we've been doing that. Is there who any is others? it? A few hands up for people who've never seen it before. Oh, a few people. Oh, Wonderful. Lucky seeing it for the first time on the big screen. <laughs> um, Neil, my first question. Have your own feelings towards this film changed since its release in 2005? Um... Not really. I mean, I suppose other than just like growing in, in pride toward it, the, the the fact that it is nearly 20 years later and people are still talking about it, people are still coming to screenings of it is uh, amazing. Um, never could have guessed that. Um, that it's found this this life is just makes me completely you know privileged, really. So, yeah, if anything, it's just my my fondness for it has grown. That's so lovely to hear. Um, could you tell us a bit about how The Descent happened, how it came about? Uh, so it came about, it came about as a kind of a challenge that when I did Dog Soldiers, uh, somebody, I, I can't remember, I can't, I can't even, I don't think I have a copy of the review, but somebody wrote a review of Dog Soldiers that basically said that, you know, this is great, but when's, when's a British filmmaker going to make a serious scary horror film again because Dog Soldiers is kind of light yeah. I mean it's scary but it's also fun yeah. and I felt like the gauntlet was thrown down then of like okay there's a challenge, a challenge. I was trying to set out to make a really really scary film at the same time I was um, trying to figure out what the hell to do after Dog Soldiers had spent my it been the focus of my life for six years it was like suddenly it was done like what's next and um, uh, I had an agent by that point and, and they set me up with a meeting with a, a, a fledgling company in London called Celador who uh, were mostly famous for creating Who Wants to Be a Millionaire as a TV series. Uh, they set up a film wing and they were going to try and get into features and they were already doing one or, or prepping one feature uh, with something completely different to The Descent. Um, but I had a meeting with Christian Coulson who uh, was, was heading production. It was, it was a very small company. It was like three people. And um, he said, you know, what have you got next? And the only thing that I literally had at the time was a feature adaptation of my student graduation film, which was a, a zombie film set on an, a, an oil rig. Um, and I sent, so I gave him this script and he read it and he said, it's great, but there's no way we can afford it. It was just, it was just going to be colossally expensive. And he said, have you got anything else? I was living up in Newcastle at the time still. And I'd gone on the train down to London for that meeting. And on the train ride back from London to Newcastle, I came up with The Descent. Um, Fantastic. Of, of something about caves. What about caves? That's a good place to set a horror film. It's dark. And it just kind of fell into place from there. And then at some point, it was like, well, what about an all-female cast? And, 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 and all the little pieces fell into place. And... and um, I put that into a treatment, sent it back to him like the next day practically, and he was like, yeah, we love it, let's do it. And then I spent the next two years actually developing the script. One was like just the initial writing the script, and then it was ready, but they were busy doing that other film, and they, they had limited resources, so they said, look, we're going to have to do it after this one, so that might take a few months or whatever, and it was like nine, ten months later that it was like, right, we're ready to go on descent. But by, during that time, I was just rewriting the script, and making it better. A train is such a wonderful, it's such a fitting place for you to come up with this idea because it's quite claustrophobic in itself, isn't it? <laughs> You're sort of stuck yeah. in this <laughs> object that you probably yeah, don't Yeah, I don't remember really. getting stuck in a tunnel on the train <laughs> that day, but maybe, 
maybe. I also must say that I love that we're in an environment where dog soldiers can be described as light. For those of you who have seen it, um, one of the characters spends half of the film with all of his internal organs hanging out. Um, it's, but it, yeah, it's light by comparison. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, speaking of caves, um, we've talked before about how you took the cast and crew of The Descent into a cave before you filmed, I think, to get a sense of the environment. Um, and the things you had to say about it were absolutely fascinating. So I wonder if you would be willing to talk about that. It, well, it wasn't the whole crew, because crew, that would have been quite a lot of people. But no, <laughs> I, myself and the cast went uh, potholing uh, in the Peak District mm -hmm. uh, several months before we shot the movie. Uh, and we were still in the planning stage of the movie then, really, because we were trying to figure out how best to do it. Um, and the thing that came out of it very quickly was that we were never going to be able to shoot the film in any real caves because we would all die. Um, because caving is absolutely, it's so bloody dangerous. And one of the weird things, I mean, a lot of the inspiration from the film came from uh, way back when, I don't know, I was like eight years old, nine years old, I went on a school trip down a lead mine somewhere. And the, the, the guy took a whole bunch of us kids down this lead mine without torches or whatever and got all the way down to this lead mine and said, right, I want everybody to turn their torches off. And we did. And it was like the first time I'd experienced pitch black, like no light whatsoever. Like you can, you can you're standing there waving your hand in front of your face. You can't see a single thing. And it was and it really had an impression on me that really stuck in my mind. But then we so we went caving with the, with the actors. And I mean, a few things happened. One is that. Uh, very quickly, like we were in the cave for like 10 minutes and the condensation from our breath alone filled the cave with fog so you couldn't see. And it also made the walls slippery like ice. And so this was all the stuff that we were like thinking, this is really cool, uh, but so dangerous. So that's, you know, we, we just would. Plus also this, this script was specifically written to have certain caves do certain things. So it's, it's a journey through this cave and we needed a crevasse and we needed a, a waterfall and we needed this and, and trying to find specific caves to fit those would have been impossible or just very, very difficult or, or it would have involved going to 50 different caves just to complete the movie. So it was like, that was never gonna happen. So there isn't a single real cave in the movie. Uh, it sets a, a couple of miniatures and a matte painting. I think that's about it really. So, yeah. It's phenomenal. Um, and I find the fact that just human breath does that to the space, absolutely haunting. A bunch of very hot people in a small space. It's cold <laughs> and moist, it's just like, boom, it's fog and you can't see anything. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of felt like this cinema at a few points over the weekend, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> gonna get in trouble for saying that. Um, so uh, the fact that you have this film about claustrophobia and you're never actually in a cave is so amazing because the caves feel perfectly mapped in the film. They're believable. Um, and the journey through them feels very physical, like it's actually happening. How did you go about creating this real space, not just the actual shots, but this um, network of tunnels to go through? Well, so much of that, I mean, it was it was in my mind writing it that it is a linear journey. You never go back to the same yeah. cavern twice. <laughs> But uh, also because I had a genius production designer who literally drew a map according to the script of what the cave would be that we're going from here to here to here to here and concocted each cave. Um, and obviously the way that it worked was, you know, because we were still doing it on a budget. So we, if we needed a big cavern, we had like one set that we, we, we used that three times in the movie to be different big caverns. And then uh, I think, you know, the, the super crawl space that she goes through, I think that was like, we only ever used that once. But then there's other tunnels in it where we used like 12 or 13 times in the film. But because of the way we lit it and the way we shot it, you can't tell because the actors were lighting their own scenes primarily and actors would never point the torch in the same place twice. Plus each time we'd use it, we'd like spray it a slightly different color or move a boulder over here or something like that. Any little tricks we could use to disguise the fact that we were basically in the same set again and again and again and again. Um, but the, the, the way that we'd chosen to shoot it gave us huge advantage for that. But it was absolutely mapped out. Um, it really, it very much feels that way. Like you get the total sense of a very constructed space that could be natural. And, and somebody said, 
um, reading the script or maybe even seeing the movie at some point said it's like a journey through the human body that that the opening is like the mouth and then you go down the throat and then at some point you end up in this kind of stomach cave that's full of all the the blood and the entrails and stuff like that and eventually she kind of gets shit out of the yeah. <laughs> you beat me to it um, <laughs> this is one of my favourite things about the film or my favourite ways of reading the film um, because obviously this is a group of female bodies descending into this hostile space um, and I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about the fact that it is specifically female bodies going into this space well, I mean, the thing is, and, and I apologize if anybody's offended by this, but and it was a woman who came up with it. So, you know, this is how it goes. But somebody referred to the what the, the pool of blood cave as the menstrual cave. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I, and I can't remember who it was. But I'm, um, <laughs> I'm really glad that you said that because I promised someone in the audience that I would mention Somebody's menstruation at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, you beat me to it. Thank you. Um, but yeah, it was it, it became kind of symbolic as a, of a journey through a, a, a not only a human body but yeah, a female body, um, especially when having when she, they encounter the, the 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 child crawler and stuff in there as well. Absolutely, um, and I definitely want to talk about the child crawler because it's such an intense moment for Sarah, the main character. Um, although it's, I'm not sure that she actually realizes it on a in a mental way at the time. No, no, it's it, it's. She's lost by that point. I think so. But um, yeah, because so so there is um, a, a, a yet another way of looking at the film, which is it's a home invasion movie, in which this family of this family of crawlers living underground get invaded by these six psychotic women who proceed to butcher <laughs> them in different ways and murder their children. Yeah, so <laughs> one way of looking at it for sure. Um, I couldn't have put it better myself, and Neil's treatment of monstrosity um, in the film, which is what we're all here to talk about, is so multi-layered. Um, in terms of constructing monsters, not just the crawlers, but the people who encounter them, um, why do you think it's so important to have these layers? Um, well, it was just a, for a film <laughs> that's about caving, it, I wanted to give it depth. <laughs> Uh, uh, I wanted to have something more to it that it was and it was something I'd learned from dog soldiers about making characters that weren't just cardboard cutouts that you know they're going to get killed and you don't care about them I'd always said with that one it's a soldier movie with werewolves because I want the I want the characters to really matter and I think that's why it has sustained and I think this is sustained as well as giving those those women uh, they're so multi-dimensional and their friendships and, and, and their relationships are so messed up and human and flawed and tragic and and everything that makes them human and that's got nothing to do with any of the monsters or the caves or anything like that it's just a group of friends who just basically like screw up and fall out and betray each other and do shit like that and so I try I wanted to try and make it work on multiple levels um and say depths <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and sorry I, I just want to quickly go back to the child crawler for a second there did everybody get that it was a Child crawler. Can we have a show of hands? Who noticed the child crawler? Okay, that's great. Because some people don't get that it's a child crawler, but then like, it's a child crawler, she stomps on its head, kills it, and then the mother comes along, and it's just obviously like, as a, another mother, so it's playing on that thing. A little bit of trivia is that the, the kid who played the child crawler was the same kid who played a child zombie in 28 Days Later in the kitchen there, so it's the same kid, yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Um, so I know that you had perhaps issues is too strong, but you encountered various opinions of what members of an all-female car should be doing <laughs> and wearing in the film. Yes. And I also know that you very much stood your ground, um, and I'm personally so grateful that you did because Descent was a hugely formative film for me as a young woman. Um, would you mind speaking a little bit about that and what you wanted from this cast? Yeah, well, I mean, there were certain... Uh, uh, so one of the producers on the film, or exec producers on the film, who's French, uh, I don't know if that's got anything to do with it, but anyway, his, <laughs> his thing, he basically said, you know, we've got this film with six uh, beautiful women going into a cave, we have to have a scene where they basically take all their clothes off and go swimming. Uh, and, and I was just so angered by this sentiment. I said, look, if that's the film you want to make, I'm leaving now. Like, we're not making that movie. 
I never set out to make that kind of movie. The whole point with making it an all-female cast was I'd done a lot of research into uh, the climbing fraternity and the caving fraternity and whatever and seeing these these incredible, active, strong, independent women going out either groups or singular or whatever the fuck it was, and none of them were wearing bikinis and none of them were stripping off and going swimming. They were doing their shit and doing it, you know, as people. And I was like, that's the movie that I want to make. And if we're going to go with a female cast, let's, let's be honourable about it in some way and, like, try and just make a great film and not treat them like they're a bunch of girls, you know? So... I fought tooth and nail for that and everybody backed down eventually and that was it. What's kind of interesting, what I thought was in the sequel that I didn't have that control over. Um, not only does Juno return, mm -hmm. but for some reason she's lost her pants. <laughs> and she's suddenly running around in these hot shorts. And it's like, what? <laughs> it's like, that's, the, that's exactly the kind of thing that I was fighting against on the first film. To be fair, it's common knowledge that if you're trapped in a cave, the first thing you do is lose your trousers. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly survival instinct. Yeah. Um, speaking of, so much of the film is about adapting to the logic of our environment, being plunged into this new space and not really understanding what you're dealing with and then seeing it affect you in various ways. And Sarah's a wonderful example of this. Uh, but it also, Juno is one of my favorite characters ever. And her monstrosity just flourishes, if that is the right word, in the cave. I was just wondering how you think monstrosity in general is created by context. Um, this, these are the tricky questions. I said she was going to ask me some Neil tricky questions. Neil cornered me earlier, um, <laughs> and I promised him a curveball question, so this is that. Questions I, I haven't thought about for the last 20 odd years, or <laughs> whatever it is. Um, well, with, what I love about Juno is that she's just, she's flawed. She's not, she's not malicious, really. She just fucks up, which is an incredibly human thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so she's both, she can, and, and, and I, I love the idea that a character can be both unbelievably heroic one moment and despicably awful the next, but it's the same person. And, and you, you, you have to kind of take that journey with it. And, but then Sarah is like becoming, she kind of becomes one with the cave at the end and, and, and kind of becomes part of it. Like she was, she will always exist down there in some form or another. And it's, I didn't think about it so much when I was writing it. It's stuff that's kind of, grown into the subtext of the film since I made it mm -hmm. and why it's fascinating that I've, I've seen essays written about it and things like that, which I, I love the fact that it's open to analysis. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is that whole other theory that the crawlers don't exist. It's all a figment of Sarah's imagination. And we kind of played around a little bit with that when there's a scene where she stands and she screams up at the air and just sheer rage and it cuts to the other girls, but the scream that you hear in the distance isn't her, it's a crawler. What does that mean? I don't fucking know. I just kind of <laughs> was playing around with the edit and thought that would be interesting. And then people start writing about it. It's like, great, I love it. Because I, 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 you, you want to leave a film open to interpretation, especially one like that. It's like, I love the fact that people find new meanings to it. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Um, on the genuinely commendable note of I don't fucking know, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Charlotte Kirk up to the stage. So Charlotte and Neil co-wrote The Lair, which is the film that you're all about to see. Um, I've had the real pleasure of seeing it twice, and I'm so excited for you all to experience it. Um, Charlotte, um, as the lead actress and co-writer, would you mind giving everyone a spoiler-free introduction to this film? I know that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. Um, so The Lair is... Uh, well, I play Kate Sinclair, who is a uh, British fighter pilot that gets shot down by insurgents in Afghanistan and who uncovers some gruelling monsters. Um, when writing it, I think we're hugely inspired by um, Alien yes. and The Thing, one of the two big inspirations. But great monster movies. Yeah, great monster movies and um, actually dog soldiers as well yeah. to a certain degree. So I think you said it's like the cousin to dog soldiers <laughs> it's, in that universe. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it deals with there's some stuff underground, but if anybody's expecting 
the you know the descent it's not the descent it's if anything it has more in common with dog soldiers in terms of its tone it was meant to be a fun b movie monster movie i just wanted to have some fun we did the reckoning previously which was quite dark and serious and it was like we just wanted to make a real fun movie mm -hmm. and i wanted to just make a b movie really just like a fun monster b movie so it's it's quite in contrast with the descent really yeah charlotte i know that the film um was quite a physical journey for you, just in terms of the amount of stunts. Um, and um, I think that you learned to fire an AK-42, is that the right good? Um, AK-47. AK-47, I am corrected. <laughs> um, could you tell everyone a little bit about your experience and that capacity in the film? Yes, um, it was definitely my most challenging role yet, uh, in terms of uh, physically, physically challenging role. Um, I'd never fired a gun before this, and then, yeah, I think it was a few hours of wep weapons training, like literally just a few hours, and then AK-47 and <laughs> all the other pistols I had to fire, and explosions, and, um, yeah, I mean, you'll see in the first 10 minutes of the film is literally just action. No dialogue, pretty much, just all action. So definitely my most physically challenging role yet, but I loved it. And then, obviously, getting in the mindset of a... Of a you know, British fighter pilot. Uh, I was lucky enough to speak with one um, who gave me some great insight. I wanted to know kind of what made her want to, you know, why did she want to become a British fighter pilot and and um, the technical side to it as well. And that really helped. And we had a great stunt team as well. Really, really great stunt team. So, yeah, we were lucky. It's such an exciting, explosive start to the film. Um, the sequence is mesmerising. Um, you will have so much to look forward to. Um, the Lair in general is such an action-packed film, and um, I know that it has been likened to dog soldiers. The thing that stood out for me in both films is the attention to one-liners in your writing process. And they're absolutely phenomenal and they stick with you. Um, I was just wondering if that's something that you really try and embed when you're writing or if it just comes naturally. I think for this movie, as, as Neil said, The Reckoning, our previous film was very yeah. dark and serious and you know almost like a drama in some respects. We just wanted to have fun with this as much as we can. I think Neil's you know, so good at these great classic one-liners and... Um, I don't know if it was something that we purposely did, or I purp I didn't purposely think of that. It was just something that... I totally did. You did? <laughs> okay. Came with the characters, but for you... Well, yeah. no, it, is, it's, it comes out of the characters. It's like trying to create characters, and it has to fit with that character somehow. But if you put a certain character in a fairly outrageous situation, and they, say, they, could, they, they can say something completely outlandish, and it lands, and it's just really funny. And, and if it comes from the unexpected characters, it's even funnier. But not mocking the situation. But never, yeah, never mocking the situation, which is kind of what we did with Dog Soldiers. It's like, um, you know, the humour needs to come from the characters and not from the situation, yeah. always. Absolutely, um, and that completely comes across throughout the film. Um, Neil, I've heard you speaking before about, I think it's tripophobia. Um, so this is a fear of closely packed holes. Um, and when I was doing research about this, some of the examples were strawberries and aerated chocolate, um, so monsters hiding in strange places. But I think you were taking this into consideration when you were designing the monster. Um, yeah, it's called um, it's trichophobia or trichophobia, mm -hmm. and it's people can be physically repulsed by textures that have lots of holes in them. Um, and if you look it up online, the first things that will pop up are these shots of like hands, but they've got lots of holes in them and it just, and people will be physically ill with this stuff. And so when it came to designing the, 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 the creatures, the alien creatures that, uh, oh, shit, give away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted to include that in their design somehow, um, uh, but you'll kind of see that in, the, in, their, in their face. <laughs> Given that you chose to design the monster like that and it's so effective, it works so well, it is genuinely scary and repulsive, what do you think it is about bodies that can't be contained that make them so monstrous? I'm thinking about the holes leaking out and it's not a smooth surface. 
Um, I don't know, it's just anything, any, I just seek anything that's going to repulse people. And you know, <laughs> when dealing with trying to create something, you like want to put in a whole bunch of like a wish list of, you know, let's, let's make it repulsive. Let's put some tentacles in there and slime and teeth and stuff like that. But, you know, I don't want to give up, give too much away. <laughs> <laughs> All of the above. Yeah. Um, and The Lair was a COVID film, if, if I'm right. Um, Charlotte, could you tell us a little bit about how you went about making the film under these very constrained conditions and how the idea came to begin with? Yes. So the idea came about uh, our friend in L.A., we were in L.A. at the time, during COVID, said, why don't we make a small COVID-friendly movie in the desert? One house, one location. Had, I've got a friend who's got a house in the desert. Yeah, ultra low yeah. budget. Let, let's just see what we can do. We're like, yeah, great. Unfortunately, Neil can't write low budget films. It's just, it's just yeah, it's too ambitious. So it, it become this home invasion. It started out this home invasion movie in the desert and then become this Afghanistan alien sci-fi movie. Um and um, yeah, but we got really lucky. Like we shot it during COVID. No one got COVID, thank God. And um, yeah, we shot it in Budapest. Mm -hmm. So that's how the idea came about. Amazing. Um, so we spoke a little bit when we were talking about The Descent about women in horror. Um, and I was just wondering what your experience has been of both playing women in very horrific situations and also being a woman who is contributing to the horror genre. I know that a lot of women, including me, turn to horror as a way of processing the world and the experiences that they find themselves in. And I was wondering if this influences your filmmaking and also if it influences your life more generally. Um, it's not really... I haven't, the last few years, haven't chosen just to do horror movies. It's just so happened to work out that way. I just want to play roles that are great stories, great characters, great stories um, in any in any form, really. Um, but horror is fun. Everyone's like, oh, are you scared? It's a horror movie. Was it, was it scary? It's like, no, they're actually, it's just great fun making a horror movie, and especially The Lair, I would say, is the most fun I've had making a film altogether. But, yeah, so, so the previous film, The Reckoning, um, that was horror and that was definitely very challenging, um, especially playing someone based on true events, the, the witchcraft and all that kind of thing. Um, you know, I felt like I had a big responsibility there. But actually, it's a re it was the reckoning was a relief in a way. It was a horror was a a medium to translate the story in such a way um, of what really happened um, to these poor women. And then the lair. We just kind of wanted just to do the opposite, just Sigourney Weaver kind of vibe. And yeah, it's, it's super empowering. And I, it, we need more, more badass women superhero. We need more of that. Couldn't agree more. And, and, and yeah, I mean, my answer to that is, is partly to do with, uh, so two different films that we've done so far. Uh, and the first one with The Reckoning was, we were trying to tap into um, not only stuff from history, but basically, you know, witch hunts are still going on today in a different form. Uh, and so we wanted to tap into that. So we were trying to say something about, you know, uh, women and the treatment of women uh, now and then. And uh, have we really like learned anything in the past you know, four or five hundred years? Uh, so we were trying to say something with that. And then with 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 the lair, I kind of went completely the opposite which is that there are women fighter pilots in the military. There are women soldiers in the military now. It's been going on for quite some time. It's not a big deal and it shouldn't be a big deal. So let's not treat it as a big deal. It's like it's everybody's all, they're all soldiers. And that's the kind of film that we're trying to make. And it's not drawing attention to the fact that the character is a, is a woman any more than other characters in the film is a woman. It's like they are just what they are. And yeah. that's, that's the way to make the movie. I think, I think um, again, especially you, we did not want to sexualise her at all. I don't think we have at all in this. Um, I don't want any time for any of that anyway. It's just too many monsters running around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> um, so my final question before we open up to the audience uh, leads on for, from this quite nicely. It's about monsters and empathy. So without giving too much in away, the monster in the lair um, is, or the monsters are quite uniquely positioned to learn from their enemies. 
Um, and there are other ways in the lair in which people who want, like the characters think are enemies, um, turn out to be something quite different. I was just wondering if monstrosity can be a vehicle for increased empathy. So not just learning about your enemies in order to bring them down, but actually to understand them on a deeper level. Neil? <laughs> <laughs> you mean love your monsters? Yes, so love your monsters, to love your exactly. Monsters. Absolutely. Uh, yes. <laughs> That's what I'd say. Uh, yes, absolutely. Learn, to, learn yeah. to embrace and love your monsters. They are, they are part of us. They come from us, and we should embrace them. Yeah, I would say actually, um, the reckoning had that. Uh, yeah, with, between me and Ursula, who was my the enemy, and um, there was that moment where she is dying and she's getting burnt alive out, the, out falling out the window, and there's that look of fuck. Oh, like, I really didn't want this to happen. I didn't want to kill you. So, yeah, it's, it's humanising that, humanising characters. And even if you hate someone or loathe someone, you, you still hopefully have some, you know, humane, you know, you feel bad. So, but I don't think there's any moments in this that I can recall. Or we, well, we show it on the screen anyway. Not that I can... Well, and it's more to do with um, um, Kabir and, and you know, yeah. empathising with... That well, sense. yeah, yes, one character for sure. I don't want to give away anything, yeah. but yeah. I'm yeah. so glad that you mentioned that moment from the reckoning because uh, it illustrates it, it perfectly, and it's mm -hmm. such an emotionally resonant scene. It's just beautiful, and beautifully done. Yeah, um, but it all comes back to Juno as well. It all comes back to Juno. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, does anyone in the audience have any questions for Charlotte and Neil? Uh, I'm sure you've been asked this about a thousand times, Neil, but um, what are your thoughts on the very infamous alternate ending for The Descent? Um, I, I, was, I assume you saw the correct ending tonight. I didn't yeah. see that either, but... <laughs> um, well, this is, it's, it's an ongoing debate. Um, the story behind the other ending was that Lionsgate wanted to release the film in the States, or did release the film in the States, and they did some testing with the original ending and it found out that although people liked the movie, they found the ending really depressing. Um, and could, you know, could they cut off the last 30 seconds of the movie, basically? So it ends with Sarah getting out of the cave and she sees Juno, Juno in the car and screams and it's the end. Um, and so they, 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 they actually released that version of the film. Uh, but then on Blu-ray and DVD or whatever, they finally released the original version and that, it's very difficult to find the cut version now. But the debate goes on as to whether which one is actually the happier ending. If I mean, neither of them are happy endings, but which one is the happier ending? Because my whole thing is like, if she gets out of the cave, she sees Juno, she's clearly out of her mind. She's lost all her friends, all her family. She's probably going to spend the rest of her life in an asylum. God knows, it's not going to be happy for her. Whereas the version that you saw tonight... She may be stuck in the cave, but in her head, she's back with her daughter again. And that's some kind of salvation or happiness for her, no matter what her fate is. And I figured that's the happier ending. But none of them are happy. <laughs> so, but, yeah. Um, first of all, it holds up really well. It's still the only film to scare the shit out of me after 30 views, so well done. Um, my question, you kind of touched on it earlier when you said about the theories that people have wrote about I wrote about The Descent uh, 10 years ago now, and it was a list of all the signs that it was all in Sarah's head. And I was just wondering if that ambiguity was always there while you were writing it, or was it kind of an afterthought? I know you kind of touched on it, but was it consistently running through the writing? Uh, it was something that grew from the writing process uh, and, and the filming and editing process as well. We actually filmed a scene... Um, of her seeing a crawler in the hospital at the beginning of the film. Where, uh, and, and, and now I, I kind of look back at it and think, what the hell was that about? <laughs> so, you know, we, we, we saw it, we was like, it didn't work at all, we cut it out. It was like, I can't even remember why I put it in the script. Like, what did it mean? Uh, <laughs> but it was very much going down the, the idea that it's all in Sarah's head. And I kind of wanted to leave that more ambiguous. Um, so that was a good reason to get rid of that. It, it's really two questions there. Just the first on The Descent Part 2. I was under the impression that you had some involvement with Number 2. I was, I was much younger watching the film. Did you have any involvement at all in Part 2? 
The only thing, I have a credit on it, was the EP, and the only thing that I actually contributed to it was there's some camcorder footage of the original cast, um, like on that they find a video and there's some camcorder footage of them messing around in the cabin, like, and I shot that and that's it. And I, but I tried to, first of all, I tried to dissuade them from making it. I just thought there's no need for it, don't do it. Um, and this is kind of maybe back in the day, you know, franchise when it wasn't like an automatic thing. It's like we've got to have a franchise. They, but they, you know, this is Pathé and Salador basically said we're going to make it anyway, uh, with with or without you. And their rationale behind it was, you know, just get get her back in the caves, give give the audience monsters. That's what they want. And I was like, oh god, if that's the way you look at it. And I tried to to steer them in a direction they wouldn't go with it. So I just put my hands up and let them make what they made. I, um, in terms of you were saying about like picking up the gauntlet of making a really kind of intense, scary kind of film, in terms of which, which you did achieve with, with the film, by the way, is that were you sort of aiming to create like a whole new film horror language or, or were you kind of looking towards sort of past horror to help build that genuine sense of new level of scariness kind of thing? Um, I wasn't trying to create any kind of new land. I was just trying to make a great movie, really. And, and I was massively inspired by The Thing, by Deliverance. You know, films that really, like, scared me. Um, you know, the ending of The Thing. I love that ambiguous, bleak ending of The Thing. I loved, you know, Deliverance of The Holiday Gone Wrong. And I, these are films that aren't cheerful. And I, I wanted to make that kind of film that was just dark. And not just literally, I mean, you know, dark <laughs> in many ways. Uh, but the language of it was to say, um, uh, like, it, I gave the, the DP and myself very specific rules, and it was written into the script, which is, we're not going to have any beautiful shafts of light through this cave. It's not going to look pretty. We want the cave to be real, and therefore it has to be lit by uh, what the characters take with them, as, a, as, you, as it is when you go to a cave. Um, and so I had to plan the whole script around which character had which light source at which time and make sure everybody had something and from a box of matches to a snap light to flaming brands to whatever it was so that we could see what the hell was going on. Uh, all these rules that we set up for the first film went completely out of the window for the second film, which does have the bright lit caves and stuff like that for no reason whatsoever. Um, but that's the kind of visual language I was trying to put in there and then the use of like the infrared camera and stuff like that and I've seen that in so many films since yeah uh, hi Neil um David Julian's score in this film is really beautiful and, and haunting at the same time it's I constantly have it on rotation on my Spotify still after all this time actually and I was just wondering with you saying that the thing was a huge reference uh, sorry inspiration for you in your movie sounds to me that uh obviously the the thing score by John Carpenter and Ennio Morricone was somewhat homaged in the film I, I'm just wondering is that intentional uh it was absolutely intentional I think David went a little bit too far in one of the sequences where he literally like copied the thing theme I was just like ee, that's a bit too much but because the rest of the score is not like that at all there's just one little bit where it's just very boom 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 and you're like okay that's the thing um i wanted to I wanted to get the feel of the thing but not necessarily copy it <laughs> i saw it first time when it came out um uh, it you know originally so back in 2005 and i was in an empty cinema with my friend and i and we literally clung on to each other for dear life for an hour and uh but watching it again in here was um equally as scary and, and so I, my questions to do with the writing of it and you know how you came up with the pacing of the jump scares because you know if it's like a line you know there's like a seismic shock every five to seven minutes and uh i became aware of it because i'm literally jumping out my seat every every few minutes and i've watched it umpteen times on dvd but it was watching it with everybody here, jumping around me, with me, and, and reacting, and uh, and the not obvious jump scares either. You know, even like things like the the crows flapping away um, as they're as they're getting nearer to the mountain, and you know. Uh, well, there was a discussion at some point um, in the script phase of like people, uh, some some people reading it, or the producers reading it, and saying, "Well, it doesn't." You know, for the first forty pages, it was like it's not really a horror film. So we need to get something in there. Um, 
and things like the crows were kind of a bit of a cheap jump, or whatever. But the the one that I'm proud of that we came up with for the opening was the metal bar through the window. Mm. Uh, I'm really happy with that one because that one gets everyone. At some point or other. But it was like I did put that in just to kind of like keep the audience awake of like saying it's a horror film, remember? Because it was very dramatic and a bunch of girls and going caving, you know. And there is there is an argument I've heard several people say this um, of saying, well. Why did we need the monsters at all? It was scary enough. But if we hadn't put the monsters in, it would I think it would be it would be a psychological thriller. It would be something else, but it wouldn't necessarily be a horror film as such. Like Deliverance is not a horror film as such. Um, I you know, so I had to take it that next step further in my whole principle of and I did do that. I mapped it out of like, oh, a jump here and you know, jump there and try to sort of pace it. And um, but I did do that of planning the whole the whole journey is like I want things to go from bad to worse to terrible to absolutely shit. And just when you think it can't get any worse, we're going to add the creatures. And it's going to go even worse and worse and worse. Uh, and then they're all going to start killing each other and stuff. So. <laughs> all sorts of things. Boards, scraps of paper. Yeah. yeah. I you did that on the lay or the reckoning, though. In my head, I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I've got a, a little question because I a bit of insider information. But so you guys, this is your second movie. So what's next? Uh, well, we've just spent the summer shooting uh, a gangster movie. A change of pace for for both of us. Uh, I mean, it's a violent gangster movie, but it's a gangster movie um, with lots of comedy and action and stuff like that. Yeah, called Duchess. So, I'll say anything about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, we were sitting there one day in London and we were talking about the classic gangster movies, the casinos, the Scarfaces, the Goodfellas. And I was like, oh, what about like a British one? Okay, yes, yeah, so there's Snatch and Layer Cake and all these kind of great things. But what about like in the last five years? But what if it's like a woman, a woman gangster? And then, we, then yeah, <laughs> the Duchess was conceived from there. Um, and uh, yeah. That's the, we that will be coming out next year. Um, but we're edit we're and Neil's editing now. Well, finished next week, um, and then we're about to do a thriller um, January February time. So yeah, kind of keep them busy. Keep them busy. Well, we wrote over the last three years. Like we wrote three scripts. We wrote um, and, and the order we wrote them in was Duchess, The Reckoning, and The Lair, and then we made them The Reckoning, The Lair, and Duchess. So it goes. I think we might have time for one more question. If anybody has a question, again, it's just about the writing process. Actually, do you um, do you outline in detail first? Uh, uh, do you like bash it out or a mix of? No, generally. I, I mean, I think I did a very rough outline of of descent, um, but once the initial story was in my head, I just went ahead and wrote it. Um, and and you were very lucky that we filmed it in kind of story order as well for the most part, and that was kind of surreal and sad of like killing off characters and saying goodbye to the, the actors, and you know each one going day by day. It's very rare that you get to film in story order, but like we had to because we were going to a cave, and then we'd have to redress that cave for some another part of the journey, so we couldn't do it any other way. Fantastic. Um, so on that note, um, if you could all join me in thanking Charlotte Kirk and Neil Marshall so much for being here. Thank you. Enjoy.